So I'm going to read to you guys today from Daniel chapter 6, and I really just want to build kind of the idea and the framework of where we're going to go today and what we're going to talk about, and then we'll come back to Daniel a little bit later in the service. I will not have forgotten about him, I promise. It may seem like it. Um, but let's go ahead and read. This is Daniel chapter 6, starting in verse 1, and it says that it pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel, who's been living in captivity for 70 years at this point, taken into Babylon, it's now led by the Medo-Persian Empire. Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. This is the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord this morning. You guys can go ahead and be seated. We are in our final week of our series called Our Community Confessions. Next week is Palm Sunday, and then we've got Easter Sunday coming after that. And uh, so we're really excited about Holy Week and what's coming up here in the coming uh, just days here at Union City. But in this series, we've been kind of, kind of going through our core values and talking about some things that ring true of the people of Union City. Some of these are true of our community now. Some of these are still a little bit aspirational, who we are striving to become. And today I want to talk to you guys from the subject of integrity, one of our core values, integrity. And our community confession with this is simple yet profound, and it's simply this, we choose what is right. And how many of you guys would agree? I know that sounds simple, but a lot uh, less simple to actually do, right? We choose what is right. And um, I was, you know, doing some reading and research this week, and I came across uh, this game, this game that came out in the 1980s, a board game called Scruples. Has anybody played this before or heard of Scruples? Yeah, I didn't really think so. Um, now, I'm a child of the 80s. I was born in July of 1989. Any 80s babies in the place today? Yeah? Come on, a few of you. We'll be best friends. Awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and I was only around for a few months in the 80s, but I claimed them fully. I love to tell people the 80s were crazy, you know? And uh, I'm really a child of the 90s, but I'll, I'll claim the 80s. I never played this game, though. It came out in 1986, and I was reading about it. And it actually seems kind of like a fun game. I don't know what the other questions are, so if you get this game and play it, I can't give my full stamp of approval, but basically what the game would do is it would ask the players questions regarding everyday ethical and moral dilemmas, and then you would have to answer accordingly, and I don't know how the rest of it's played, but that's how it at least starts. And a few of the examples um, of the cards that people could draw, I wanted to read to you, and I just want to know from you guys how you would respond. So full crowd participation, I want to know what you would do. The first card was this, your boss gives you expensive front row tickets to a hit play, you forgot to mark the date on your calendar, and you missed the performance. The next day at work, your boss asks, how was the play? Do you admit that you missed it? How many of you guys are going to admit that you missed the play? How many of y'all are going to make something up, like something elaborate, right? I'm, I'm a little bit more of a people pleaser, so that's going to be like where I go to, right? I'm going to be like, oh, it was amazing. It was incredible. And he'll be like, can you show me pictures or video? Like, no, I was so locked in, I didn't take a single photo, you know? I don't know. I don't know what I would do, actually. Um, all right, how about this one? You buy a cocktail dress or a sport coat for a special occasion. You wear it once and then realize you have little further use for it. Do you return the dress or the coat and ask for a full refund? Now, can we have a moment of honesty in the place? Has anybody done this before? Let's raise our hands. If you guys would stand, we're going to pray for you guys at this moment. We're going to invite you forward and uh, just ask that God would intervene. Um, Full disclosure, about nine years ago, I did this. But anyway, it's fine. It was a coat. I wore it for a funeral. It was all good. Um, the, third, the third question. I was a 23-year-old youth pastor, had nothing nice to wear, and then I didn't need anything nice to wear after that. So, all right, third thing. A troublesome employee applies for a position in another department. You're relieved. Maybe you're overjoyed. When asked, do you give a glowing reference so the transfer can go through? You're like, oh, they're amazing. Lee Horrible, right? So I don't know if you would do it or not. Um, I don't know if I would. Probably not. But anyway, what I love is that we're all confronted, you know, daily with situations. Some of these are kind of funny. 
But really, when it comes down to life, we are confronted with situations, with daily decisions that, unlike a board game, actually have real consequences in our lives. Things that we come up against where our decisions actually matter. These things have consequences, right? And the decisions that we make, they're going to affect our character. They're going to affect our careers, our reputation, our families, our future, and, and even our relationship with God. And so the choices we make are a great revealer of the level of integrity that we have. You want to know if you have integrity or not? Then I think what you can do is just start looking at the daily decisions that you're making. You cannot claim to have integrity and be consistently making decisions that don't align with having integrity. That'll reveal it right off the bat. So I want to start today by kind of asking ourselves the question, what is integrity? It's kind of funny, the more that I dove into this all throughout the week and I tried to figure out and define integrity, it's almost like the more nuanced and, and confusing integrity became. There's no simple way to define it. And so rather than reading a simple definition and moving on, I kind of wanted us to get a full picture and a larger, a larger breadth of what it looks like to be a person of integrity. And so I want to talk to you about integrity from two different perspectives today. And I want to look at per- integrity as a matter of foundation and also a matter of integration. So integrity as foundation and integrity as integration. Well, what, what do I mean by foundation? Well, foundation, I want to ask ourselves the question, is my life sturdy? Is there a soundness and a steadiness to my life. One way I think we can learn more about integrity is to look at it from an engineering perspective. I'm no engineer, but you can read about this stuff on Google. Praise God. There's a, there's a term in engineering called structural integrity. And I remember hearing about this, you know, five or six years ago, and it kind of preached to me then, and it's still preaching to me day, today, and I think it will for you as well. Structural integrity defined is this. It means a structure or structural component is fit for purpose under normal operational conditions, and is safe even if, even if, uh, even should conditions exceed that of original design. How many guys know that? I'll preach a little bit. This includes supporting its own weight, aiming to prevent deformation, breaking, and catastrophic failure through its predicted lifetime. Because I think a great way to visualize your life and to analyze your life is to daily ask yourself the question, what am I building? I think there's a lot of people and far too many people that are just living life. In life, you're not just living, but you are building something. What are you building? Every single day, you're building something. What is it? And I want want you to ask yourself the questions. Am I building something that is fit and sturdy enough to hold the weight of God's calling on my life? Are you building something that is fit to hold in the middle of the storms that life can throw at you, the unexpected things in life? And are you building something that ultimately will stand the test of time? One of the questions my dad has asked me since I was probably in middle school is, Brandon, are you gonna finish well? Because how many know it's good to get off to a good start? It's a lot better to actually finish. And there's a lot of people in life, not just in pastoral ministry or in the ministry in general, but just Christians and people, human beings, that can start well but never finish. And I want to build a church full of people that don't just have a good run for a short amount of time, but people who can run the distance and go the distance. Are you going to finish well? And so I think it's a matter of personal integrity that will allow you to answer yes to those questions. That yes, you can hold the weight of the call of God. Yes, you can handle the storms of life and the unexpected things. And yes, your life and your integrity will stand the test of time. So what else can we learn about personal integrity through structural integrity. I know you came in today asking yourself that same question. And there's a lot to be learned about this. And the first thing is this, that both structural integrity and personal integrity require a strong foundation. And so though it's a great question to ask yourself, what am I building? I think an even better question is to ask yourself, not just what you're building, but what am I building on? What is the foundation of your life? And right here we can cue Jesus' parable of the two builders, right? It tells a story about how there's two men who build their house. They build their structure. One builds on the sand and one builds on the rock. And the most fascinating thing about this story is that both builders experience the same storm but have completely different results. Why? Because one man had a weak foundation while the other had a strong foundation. 
And so is your life built on the rock? What does it mean to have your life and your foundation built on the rock? The easy Christian Sunday school answer is I just, I build my life on Jesus. And if that's how you answer that, I would say you're correct, mostly, kind of. Yes, it means to build your life on Jesus, but even Jesus himself said that it is not enough just to build on a belief of me or by listening to my words or reading my words, but the life built on the rock is receiving the word of Jesus and living the word of Jesus. Look what he says in Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So Jesus says, man, if you want to have a strong foundation, then you've got to practice my word. This is why here at Union City, we're not just about calling ourselves Christians. We are about being people who practice and live in and walk in the way of Jesus. That's what it means. And it's not just some catchy catchphrase. It's that I want you to have a foundation that you can build your life on. It's only going to come by living the way of Jesus. The second thing is both structural integrity and personal integrity require regular maintenance and attention. You know, if you're building, if you've got a building or you've got a bridge or maybe even an airplane, an airplane can have structural integrity or a lack thereof. And I don't know about you, but every time I'm in an airplane and that thing's about to take off, I am thankful that they undergo a lot of maintenance and the people are paying attention. Right? The people are, are screwing the screws back in that might have come out mid-flight, right? At least I tell myself this to make myself feel better. But I want to know when that plane goes up in the air and when it comes back down, it's intentional that it's coming back down. Right? We're doing it where we want to, when we want to. Right? I'm grateful for structural integrity in the building that I'm standing in, on bridges I go over and airplanes I fly in. And guess what? Here's the reality today. You also need regular maintenance and your soul needs regular attention you need regular attention you need regular maintenance and so I think I'm gonna give you a lot of questions to ask yourself today I think you need to also ask yourself you need to ask others that are in community with you that you can be accountable to and you need to ask God where are the cracks in my foundation where are the weak points in this structure called my life that I am building and you better believe that when you ask God where you're weak, he's going to reveal those areas to you. But it's up to us to choose whether we're going to listen to that or not. When you ask other people, if you ask somebody who's honest, hey, can you tell me some weak points in my life? You better believe they're going to tell you. Right? If they're one of your friends, if they, if they value you, they're going to tell you what they see in your life. Because we want to make sure that we don't have cracks in our foundation. You know, my dad, again, who's big on integrity, he's told me this for a long time as well. He said, Brandon... You could, your integrity could stand for 30 years, but it can also collapse in 30 seconds. And so integrity is not a one-time decision. Okay, all right, I'm a man of integrity. All right, I'm a woman of integrity. I think it's great to have maybe that moment where you decide, but please understand, it's a daily decision after that, and not even daily. I believe it's a moment-to-moment decision that you're going to say, I am a follower of Christ, which means I am a man or a woman of integrity. So you got to pay attention. And the third and final thing is that both structural integrity and personal integrity are built on a framework of principles and standards. And so I'll say it like this. While a, building, while a building is designed and constructed based on engineering principles, a Christian life is built on, designed, and constructed based on biblical principles. Right? You cannot build a life of faith outside of the framework of biblical principles. Anything you try to build your life of faith on other than scripture, I believe, is destined to fall. So this is what one side of integrity means. It's that you have a foundation for your life. It's going to give you a sturdiness and a steadiness in your life. So the question is, will what I am building remain standing? The other part of integrity is a word that they share a similar root, and it's the word integration. Integration is is interesting because really what this means is the combining of of one thing with another, so they become whole. Or another definition is to bring into equal participation. And so when we look at integrity through the lens of integration, it means this, that we are not living segmented or segregated lives, but we are living whole, complete, and integrated lives. You see, integrity means that all of the parts of me are integrated into one, and every part of me is brought into equal participation. You know, one of my favorite movies, like this thing is all-time top 10, 
And if you've not watched it before, this is your homework today, okay? One of my favorite movies is a movie called Remember the Titans. It's a football movie. Has anybody not seen this film? Has anybody, can you admit that? It really hurts my heart. Okay, that's your homework today. Remember the Titans. This came out, funny story, this came out when I was in middle school. And my middle school football team, we were in the playoffs, and our coach took us to see this, this uh, movie to try to pump us up to play really well the next day. And the movie pumped us up, but then we got smoked by 25 points the next day. So, but I still love the movie. It's a great movie. Now, remember the Titans, what I love about it is it's this movie that's set in a time of segregation. It's a school and a football team that are attempting integration. They're trying to come together, right? White, black, and everybody else trying to come together to play on this team. And also what I love is that it was from T.C. Williams High School, which did you know is in Alexandria, Virginia? I almost wrecked my car when I moved here driving by the home of the Titans. I'm calling my mom. I'm like, it's here. It was crazy. Anyway, in this moment, though, they're trying to integrate, and it's messy, and it's difficult, and it takes some time. But if you've seen this movie, you remember that moment that everything starts to come together, right? They go on a jog to, to the battleground of Gettysburg where there's all these tombs and they're seeing, they're, they're, he's talking about this is hallowed ground. And in that night practice, right, they start pushing each other, but they're saying strong side, left side. And as a seventh grader, I'm like, I don't even know what this stuff means, but it just sounds amazing, right? And they're, they're beginning the process of uniting together as one. And once this team comes together, once they're united, Man, it was like the Titans couldn't lose. There was a new synergy and a new strength as they aligned toward a common goal. And I tell you this because this is the picture of what your life can look like. And I'm not talking about you integrating with somebody else. I'm talking about when you integrate with you. Yeah. When all of the parts of your life be become to be brought together so you're not living in parts, but you're living as a whole. Yeah, sure. And I'm telling you guys, it's difficult and it's messy, but if you can do it, if you can unite your life into one whole, you will have a new spiritual strength and synergy that you've never experienced before in your entire life. And this is what I believe is the promise of integrity. But I think many people, maybe if not most people, fail to do this. And we continue to live segregated, compartmentalized lives. And so really it doesn't look like it's just one whole. It looks more like this, that I have my work life and I have my home life. And I've got my, you know, you got your dating life, or if you're married, you got your married life, you've got your secret life, your social life, and, and then in one of those compartments fits your faith life. This is that part of me that's like the church going, you know, I spend my time at church on Sunday, maybe I go to forum group, this is my faith life. And the reality is this, that if you segment your life like this, you're not living integrated, you are living disintegrated. Yeah. And let me say it like this, a life that is lived in parts will eventually fall apart. So if you want to destine yourself toward a life that's going to collapse at some point, and it may not be now, it might be when you're 40, it might be when you're 60, it might be later on, but I'm telling you, if you continue to live segmented and in parts, your life will eventually fall apart. You see, integrity says that all of these things are one and the same. So integrity says this, that I am the same here as I am there. Integrity says I'm the same with these friends as I am with those friends. Integrity says this, integrity says I'm the same on my work business trip as I am at home with my wife and kids. Yeah. Integrity says that I am the same publicly as I am privately. Now, none of these things are easy to do, but this is the call of integrity. The leadership expert, a great Christian man as well, his name is John Maxwell. I love what he says. He says, integrity welds what we say, think, and do into a whole person. So that permission is never granted for one of these to be out of sync. I love the visual of that. How do you know you have integrity? Integrity means that what you think, what you say, and in in what you do actually align together. And when those things are out of line and out of sync, that means you have a lack of integrity. And I even love the way he puts this. You have to give yourself permission for one of those things to be out of sync. It is ultimately a decision that you make and something that you allow. And this is exceedingly difficult to do. And this is why most of us, most people, even most Christians, tend to be not a shining example of integrity, but rather a shining example of hypocrisy. Right? Have you ever met a hypocrite before? You ever looked at our church, another church, other Christians, and thought, man, that's just a bunch, a bunch of hypocrites? One of my favorite things when people say that about a church, right, especially like another Christian, they're like, man, that church is a bunch of hypocrites. I'm like, you know what? That's great because we always have room for one more. 
So come and join us. You'll fit in great. It'll be awesome. You know what I'm saying? That's not original with me, but I stole that from somebody else. So, but here's the thing. Hypocrisy is the opposite of integrity. So if integrity is, is a life that is united into one, hypocrisy is a life that is divided into multiple parts. That's what it means to be a hypocrite. And Jesus, over and over and over again, who did he come against the most? Who did he have the most difficulty with? It was people that he called hypocrites. Those who were pretending to be one thing and living entirely as another. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is presenting what is called the woes in Scripture. And he's publicly calling out the Pharisees and the religious leaders because they were living in such a way that nobody knew what was actually happening internally. And he says this in verse 25. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Now, this is a pretty intense insult in our day and age. I think this was even a greater insult when Jesus said it. And I don't think his intention was to insult. His intention was to call them out. But for us, a hypocrite means, hey, you're two-faced. You say one thing, you do another. You say you're one thing when you are, in fact, another. But the picture in the first century would have been even stronger. You see, a hypocrite wasn't an insult. It was actually the, the name of an actor, a very skilled actor. And often the hypocrite in a play was somebody that could play multiple parts. And so they could put on a, an outfit, have a mask. They could be one person, run behind stage, change their outfit, grab a new mask, change their voice, and oftentimes the audience would have no idea that it was still the same person. They were skilled in the art of acting. And so when Jesus looks at the Pharisees and religious leaders, he's not just saying, hey, you guys are saying one thing and doing another. He's saying, you guys, you put on this air that you are some, some holier-than-thou version of everybody else, but please understand, I see right through it, you're actually just skilled actors. You're good at putting on masks and changing your voice and reciting memorized lines, and that's it. And he said, people around you may not see it, but I see right through it. They may not know it, but God knows it. You're not fooling me. And then it goes on in verse 25. He says, you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside it's messy, right? They're full of greed and self-indulgence. He says, blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will be clean. You know, I think what Jesus is getting at is, I don't even think this is just an indictment of the Pharisees. I mentioned this a few weeks ago, that I think in humility, we should always place ourselves in the position of, of even the people that Jesus is coming against sometimes, to realize that we're not perfect, we're not Jesus, and I think far too often we look more like the Pharisees than we would ever like to admit, right? That's humility, to approach scripture in that way. So I think what Jesus is saying is not just true of Fer the Pharisees, I think it's true of human nature, and the point that he was making was this. He's saying, look, humans, and you Pharisees as well, humans tend to be mostly concerned about and preoccupied with image, but God is most concerned about integrity, yeah. right? So we're concerned about what we look like on the outside, and God said, I don't care what you look like on the outside. What do you actually look like on the inside? You see, image is what people think you are. Integrity is who you really are. Image is what people see. Integrity is what God sees. And there's a difference between the two of these things. And so Jesus, he gives us this visual. He's like, look, you're, you're like people that wipe down the outside of the dish when the inside is still dirty. Imagine going to a friend's house and you walk in, you're about to drink out of one of their cups and it's just full of just sticky stuff in there. You're like, what is this? Like, oh no, but I clean, I clean the outside of it. It should be fine. Right, it's disgusting. This is the picture that he's painting. That doesn't make any sense. So he says, what I want you to do is not be obsessed with image and cleaning the outside. I want you to be concerned about cleaning the inside. And of the overflow of a heart that is being cleansed, the outside will be cleansed as well. Let me sum up what Jesus meant by this. I think Jesus was saying this, that if integrity is your greatest concern, then image will become the least of your concerns. You don't have to worry about your image if you first are concerned about your integrity. Integrity will wash the inside and it will cover the outside. But again, let's go back to human nature for a second because this is what we're fighting against. I don't know if you know this about you, but you're a human. And we have a lot of weird tendencies, right? And here's one of the things about human nature is that we would so often, we would rather be bad than to look bad. So we, we will decide that I will continue to allow things in my life, in my heart that are rotting my soul and cover it up so I can look like I am, am good and look like I have integrity rather than opening ourselves up to God and to others around us and accountability to actually deal with that issue. 
So we'd rather be bad than, than look bad. It's crazy because we would rather to continue to struggle internally than to look at all like we're struggling externally. And isn't this the case? I've done this before so many times in my life that I've kept something aside and said, I got to put on a face because I'd rather deal with my image than have God deal with my integrity. And God says, I want to deal with first with the integrity. But let me give you a little bit of encouragement. Integrity is not about trying to live perfectly, but rather about living honestly. You cannot have integrity without honesty. So you got to be honest with yourself, with others, and with God. I love what the uh, famous Bible commentator Warren Wearsby, I love what he says about this. He says, hypocrisy means deliberately pretending that none of us lives up to his ideals. None of us is all that he would uh, like to be or that he could be in Christ. But that is not hypocrisy. Falling short of our ideals is not hypocrisy. Pretending we have reached our ideals when we have not, that is hypocrisy. So you are not a hypocrite when you fall or when you fail. You're a hypocrite when you're falling and failing, yet you're pretending like you have it all together. When you hold a set of ideals up here and you act like you live accordingly, knowing that you're living down here, and then here's the slippery slope of hypocrisy, you will start to judge others, not based on the level which you currently exist, but the level that you currently pretend to be on. And so often you know where you struggle the most, where you judge other people the most. We become highly critical of others because it's, it's some weird way that we cover up for our own inadequacy and our own in, in, inefficiencies and insufficiencies. Wearsby goes on to say this, people with integrity are people who are honest with themselves, with others, and with God. We've been saying this, right? They don't wear masks and they don't waste energy pretending to be what they aren't. I wonder if some of you are tired and you're blaming it on your job, but the problem is you're wasting all your energy pretending. We're tired and we're exhausted. This is one area where we can just turn it over to God and say, I need some rest in my soul, God. Give me some integrity. They're they're not afraid of what others might find out about them because they have nothing to hide. The alternative to integrity is hypocrisy, and that eventually leads to duplicity, becoming two persons inside, neither of whom knows the other. Without inner wholeness, we can't function successfully in life or enjoy all that God wants us to enjoy. We must cultivate integrity. That means knowing God, God's forgiveness, God's truth, God's church, and God's love. The Gospel of 1 John is a guidebook for the kind of personal integrity that comes from a faithful walk with Jesus Christ. What John calls walking in the light, no shadows, nothing to hide. This is the gift of integrity. That you don't have to live a hypocritical life, a duplicitous life where you have two sides of you that often don't even know one another. This is what makes it so difficult sometimes to discern in our, own, in our own spirit. Is we can get so good at living a duplicitous life that we don't even know we're doing it. This is why we have to open ourselves up to God and to accountability. And I think this is exactly what we saw in our opening text as we read about Daniel. I want to bring Daniel back in for a moment. We read about Daniel, and he's this man of, of great integrity, right? He's raising in the ranks of leadership in this empire. He's uh, been a, a captive for 70 years in exile. Yeah, he just keeps finding favor with God and with people. And as they try to set him over others in leadership, the people put him on trial, basically. I almost like, liken this to when we have a Supreme Court nominee, and then they go through just weeks of people combing through everything they've ever done, every word they've ever said. This is what they're, what they're doing to Daniel. They're backtracking to his friends. They're going through his stuff in his apartment. They're going on Daniel's Facebook and Instagram and seeing what he might have po- posted 12 years earlier about Babylon. And what's amazing is when it comes down to it, they can't find anything against Daniel. Remember what the text says. It says that this, the administrators and satraps, they tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. And finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the laws of his God. Daniel becomes the epitome of integrity, and almost frustratingly so. If you've ever read the first six chapters of Daniel, you're like, bro, just make a mistake somewhere, like the rest of us. Show me some humanity, man. And you, you don't find anywhere. Daniel is a, is, a, is a walking example of integrity. He's so consistent. If I can be honest, that's what I want for my life. Again, I'm not seeking perfection. That's not possible. Christ was perfect because we can't be. That's not, the, that's not the pursuit, but I want to be a man of integrity that even where I'm not perfect, I'm honest about it, yeah. and I bring it to the light. Yeah. 
and I want to be a person that walks like this, and I want to live in such a way that the only thing that somebody could bring against me, like with Daniel, the only thing that they could, they could ever find is that, and this, this, this was the charge against Daniel. I don't know if you caught this. Their charge with Daniel was that he's too faithful to his God, that we're only going to trap him if we make some crazy law that causes him to try to walk against what he believes, his convictions, because we know Daniel won't do that. And imagine if that's the only thing that can be said about you, yeah. is we can't get them unless it's something to do with their faith in God. And I think right now, as we're living in a crisis of integrity in our world, in leadership across our nation, and even in the church, I think we need more people to rise up and say, look, I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to live a life of integrity before the Lord and before others. Yeah. We've got to stand and live an integrous life. So I want to get practical for a few moments. And you might be asking the question, as I was, as I was writing this message, well, how do we do this? What are some practical ways that we can begin to walk in integrity? And if you're asking that right now, I'm glad you asked that question. It's a good question. Here's what integrity means. Let's get practical for a few moments. Integrity means this, right? We choose what is right. Let's break this down. We choose what is right even when no one can see. So how do you know you have integrity? Not because you make good decisions when other people are around, but when you make right choices and good decisions when nobody else is around. It was um, Thomas McCauley who said the measure of a man's real character or a woman's real character is what they would do if they would never be found out. I heard this question a long time ago, probably a decade ago, from a youth pastor. And I remember when I heard this question, I thought, that's a silly question. But I remember it a decade later. So how many know that was a good question? And basically what he said was this, and again, it's going to sound silly, but he said, you want to know the level of integrity that you have, or at least get a feel for it. He said, imagine for a moment what you would do if you were completely invisible for a day. And all of a sudden, your little middle school brain starts just moving, right? And all my, you know, pervy friends next to me, their brains are moving, right? And people start thinking about things. I know, I know nobody right now is thinking about, you know, I'm going to go do all kinds of random acts of kindness, and I'm going to set prisoners free that have been falsely accused. No, you think I'm going to rob that bank? I would probably take that, that jacket that I can't afford and whatever else is coming to mind right now we don't want to talk about right now. But what would, what would that look like for you? And again, a silly question, but I thought, what a good exercise for us to walk through. What would I do if nobody would ever know? You know, I think we have to remind ourselves often that in life there really isn't such a thing as a secret life or a private life. That before God, there's no such thing as a secret. There's no such thing as something being private. In Matthew 6, 4, Jesus is talking about giving and how when we give, we don't have to alert the world and let, let everybody know about our generosity and what we gave. So he says, so when you give, do it so that your giving may be in secret. Then your father, who what? Who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So other people may not see, but God will see. Then you have Luke 12 too. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed. Nothing is hidden that will not be made known. So what is concealed now will be revealed later. And he's saying, he's talking about that moment that we stand before God someday, that there's going to be this great revealing. And the scripture tells us that we will be held accountable for our actions. And James even says, you will be held accountable for every careless word you speak. And it makes us stop and have a little bit of caution. John 3, 19 says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Be very cautious and aware of the seasons in life where you find yourself drifting into the shadows. Where you find yourself pulling away from church or pulling away from accountability. Because what that shows you is that you're living in such a way that you don't want other people to see. Acts of evil or acts that do not honor God love the darkness. But he says, but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light. So that it may be seen plainly what they do has been done in the sight of God. Let me say it like this. People of integrity actually love the light. They don't, they're not afraid of what's going to be exposed. And when they are doing things that do not honor God, they actually want those things to be brought to the light so that it can be dealt with. You're a person of integrity when you love the light and not the darkness. The second thing is this. Integrity means that we choose what is right even when it seems insignificant. We choose what is right even in those moments where it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Now, I wonder if you've ever been in a position like that before. Um, a little over a year ago, my family, we had moved from Arlington. So we're from New Mexico, if you don't know our story. Two years ago, we moved to Arlington and then lived there about 10 months and then moved into Shaw in D.C. And that second move was, was a financial hit for us. We had lost some of our security deposit, 
Then now how many of you know when you come in for that next rental, you're putting down your security deposit, your first month of rents. And uh, so we were strapped on cash. I've got three little kids. Life is expensive. My youngest son, Archie, just a few weeks later was in the hospital for three days with RSV. So we were starting to get the hospital bills rolling in. And we were feeling overwhelmed. I felt like I was drowning. That was probably the hardest couple of months of my life, November and December of, of last year. And um, we were at the grocery store. Though my whole family went to Giant and Shaw. And I cannot stand grocery shopping for my whole family because it's so expensive. It's ungodly. And we're getting enough groceries for about a week. And here's my nature. I'm going to just be honest with you. When it comes to the finances and stuff, when we check out at the grocery store or I'm at Target with my wife, I like to dismiss myself from the purchasing process. And I'm like, don't even tell me what it costs because I don't need this kind of negativity in my life right now. <laughs> you just track it. Tell us if we got any money. It's good. Whatever. Because my wife can spend some money at Target. Um, so anyway, we... She'll have the mic next week. She can say what she wants about me. Uh, but I was, this time we had all the kids and I was making the purchase. I had my debit card and it was like over $100 in groceries. I remember sliding in my debit card just thinking, God, like this hurts so bad. Like we need a financial miracle. So I pay, I take my debit card out and all the transaction goes through. It starts dinging. We take our stuff and that giant, that like six foot long receipt that giant prints, I take the receipt and I normally don't ever look at the receipt. I just throw it in the bag and, and I'm on my way. And for whatever reason, I looked at the receipt, and everything had rung up as zeros. Everything. Everything was zero dollars. I went to the total, zero dollars. And my first thought as I'm walking out of giant, I look into the heavens, and I say, God, is this you? <laughs> Am I walking in favor and blessing? Like, I was literally praying, God, I need a blessing. And it's like, zeros. Here you go, son. You are highly favored. And I was like, this is amazing. And all of a sudden, I took two steps, and I stopped dead in my tracks. And I thought, man... I love the blessing of God. I'm not sure it's going to come like this, though. And we were in a season of such financial difficulty, but I was praying to God, saying, God, we trust you to be our provider. You're Jehovah Jireh. We're at this young church plant at the time that was only a few months old, and, and we're asking people to give, and we're saying, hey, we want to spend the money that comes in with great integrity and great care. And I felt like in the moment, the Holy Spirit or whatever it was that was stopping me was saying, Brandon, this is not a gift from God, but this is actually a test from God. Are you going to walk back in that door, or are you going to walk out receiving your blessing? And so I walked back in. I showed my wife, and I just said, she hears the Holy Spirit better than I do. And I said, am I hearing the Holy Spirit? Or tell me if we should leave right now, and we can run. We can make a break for it. <laughs> she said, nah, we should probably go. So we went back in. I showed the lady. Her first reaction was like, why in the world are you coming back? But she was also like, but thank you. Because it actually would have reflected poorly on her for $100 plus dollars just to go missing in the store. And so she rung it back up. She gave us her employee discount. Praise God. So it only cost like $90. And, <laughs> and so we got, the, we got the discount. She was super thankful. And here's what's crazy is I walked out that day with less money but with greater integrity. Yeah. And I think that's what we got to look at in our life is what are those moments where it's, it's, not, a moment, it's not a matter of integrity. It's a matter of what's expedient, right? It might just be good for you in the moment, but we want to say that we are people that don't just choose what is right when it's a really big deal, but also we choose what is right even when it's small. Yeah. Right? I heard a pastor say this a long time ago, how you do anything is how you do everything. Yeah. How you do anything is how you do everything. This is why when we had youth interns for our youth group, we'd be setting up chairs every Tuesday, and I wanted those chairs to be so straight, like ungodly straight, right? I was making a big deal out of it. And they'd be setting those things up, and I would be bending down, looking down the aisle, and I'd be like, seven chairs down, you got to move it back a half inch, you know? And they're looking at me, rolling their eyes, and I just kept saying to them, how you do anything is how you do everything. And I wanted them to understand that it matters how you do the smallest things in life because it reflects on the larger things in life. Yeah. I think Jesus said something about this, right? He said, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. Which means this, this is the biblical principle. God entrusts the big things with those who take seriously the small things. Yeah. Take seriously the small stuff, and God will trust you with the larger things. This was the story of David, right? Faithful in the pasture to shepherd sheep, and God takes him from the pasture to the palace where he would become the shepherd of an entire nation. Why? Because he had integrity in obscurity when no one could see him, with a job that seemed meaningless. And some of you guys might be sitting in here today with a job that seems meaningless, or whatever you might be doing, thinking, ah, I just, man, God's looked over me, and you don't give your best at whatever you do. You're not giving your best at school. You're not giving your best in your job. 
And I wonder if God is waiting on you to have integrity where you currently are before he moves you on to something bigger and something greater. Will you have integrity in this space? The next thing is this. Integrity means this. We choose what is right regardless of outcome. We don't just choose what is right because it's a good outcome. We choose what is right even when it's a terrible outcome. Let me, let me define integrity like this. Integrity is doing what you ought to even if it costs you. Even if it costs you to maintain integrity is I'm still going to do the right thing. And you see this all throughout scripture of heroes of the faith. You see this all throughout Christian history of anybody that we admire, there's been great cost involved in following Jesus. I think about Joseph. Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers. He goes into Egypt. He's living in Potiphar's house. He's gained favor. Even though he's a slave, it's still not a good situation, but he's gained favor with Potiphar. And then I love what the Bible says. It's, it's just so honest and it gets real. And it says this, that Joseph was well built and handsome. And then it says this, and Potiphar's wife took notice. She's one of the funniest lines in all of scripture. I just always imagine her sipping her sweet tea, looking outside. Joseph's just cleaning the pool. She's just like, Potiphar, who is that, right? And the Bible tells us that she starts coming after Joseph, like repeatedly. She'd kind of get along with him, like, come to bed with me, sleep with me. And he kept trying to evade her. And one day she corners Joseph, nobody's home. She grabs his cloak. And she says, come to bed with me now. And this man literally runs out of his clothes to get away from this woman. She's left with his cloak, and he's running naked out the door, right? And as he's running, he took seriously what Paul would write about in the New Testament, to flee from sexual immorality. He took it literally. He's running. How many of you guys would agree this was an act of integrity? But what happens? He's falsely accused. Potiphar's wife said, man, he tried to force his way onto me. Potiphar believes his wife sends Joseph to prison. He did what he ought to, but it came at a great cost. Daniel's integrity led him straight to the lion's den. Guys, you cannot just act in integrity when you know it's going to have a favorable outcome. We act in integrity no matter what the outcome is, trusting God ultimately with the ultimate outcome. See, integrity means this, that it, it's going to cost you something. It might cost you friendships. Your integrity might cost you promotion at some point. If you're seeking elected office at some point in your life, integrity might cost you votes. Integrity might come at the cost of a breakup in a relationship that doesn't honor God. Integrity might cost you financially. You might actually have to be honest while you file your taxes. You might have to make more ethical business decisions and practices. It's what it means to have integrity. Proverbs 11 talks about how allowing integrity, having integrity in our life, it allows it to guide us. It becomes a guide. But you're only going to know if integrity guides you when you get to the point that keeping integrity costs you. Yeah. How, do you how do you know if you're guided by integrity? You kept it in a moment that you knew it was going to cost you greatly. And then the last thing is this. Integrity means that we choose what is right because it honors God. Our integrity honors God. What if we stop looking at integrity simply as a small idea of just making good choices and we looked at integrity as an act of worship before God? They said, God, these are the things that I want to do. This is what's being thrown at me, but I'm going to surrender all of that. I'm going to submit to your will. And as, out of an act of worship, I'm going to do, God, what you want me to do and what you have called me to do. Integrity honors God. And one of the most beautiful things is this, that God honors integrity. If you want to be somebody that walks in blessing and walks in favor with both God and people around you, then be like Joseph and be like Daniel and be like Esther and be somebody that walks daily in integrity. God honors integrity. Psalm 41 says, I know you are pleased with me for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you hold me up and you set me in your presence forever. Because of what? His integrity. God holds him up and he's allowed to be set in the presence of God forever. And so, so far in this message, we talked about the, kind of the idea of integrity in theory, what, what integrity can look like practically, trying to walk it out, some small things that we can be looking for and looking at in our life. But I want to close very briefly on these. I have four things. I'm just going to kind of fly through them. What's the fruit of integrity? So if you do this, if you live it out, what's going to result in your life? I think there's some amazing, beautiful, and biblical benefits to living a life of integrity. The first fruit of integrity is stability, that you're going to have a stability of life. From the psalm we just read in Psalm 41, right, he says, because of my integrity, he said, 
you uphold me. God will uphold the life of those who walk again, not in perfection, but with integrity. Proverbs 10, 9 says, whoever walks with integrity walks securely. Guys, life is so unstable and so uncertain. It's shaky ground. And so we need integrity to be some stable ground for us to walk on in this life. You want this stability so you're not tossed around by your emotions, your temptations, and worldly influences. Integrity gives you sure footing. So you're going to have stability. The second fruit of integrity is what I'm going to call tranquility. Now, I could have just called this peace, but all four of these end in the letter Y, and I had to keep that going. Tranquility or peace, however you want to write that down. You have this inner tranquility, this inner peace. Why does integrity come with tranquility? Here's why. When you have integrity, you're not living a life where you're constantly worried about being found out. It's just like there's something to hide where somebody texts you. As a pastor, I'm so aware that every person I text, hey, can we meet up? I have to add a lot of disclaimers and qualifiers, like nothing's wrong, I haven't found anything out, I just wanna meet for coffee. So if I just say, hey, can we meet? Everyone's running through every sin they've ever committed. What did I do last week? Like, and, but integrity says that you can receive a text that says, can we meet, and you're fine. You're like, hey, there's nothing to hide. I'm good. You live at peace inside, not just wondering for the day that somebody's gonna find out about being unfaithful in your marriage or your bad business practices or where you cheated on something in college or whatever that looked like, you live with integrity. There's a peace that comes with that. The next one is my favorite one, which is legacy. Proverbs 20 verse seven says, the godly walk with integrity, blessed are their children who follow them. Your integrity will be a blessing to your future children should you have them. Today, I walk in the continued generational blessing of the integrity of my dad's dad, my mom's dad, and my mom and dad now. And I feel like I am living in this mansion of integrity that I did not build, I'm just living in. And I hope in my life to continue to build on to what's already been built for me. You know, practically and, and literally in life, one of the most amazing things you can ever hand down to your children or future generations is your home. If you're ever able to buy a home, and you can pass that down so they can live in it or they can sell it and be financially blessed. That's a massive blessing. You know what's an even greater blessing? Is if you can pass down integrity. A life that is built on the word of God. A life that is built not on perfection but on honesty and integrity. And you, you build a beautiful home and shelter for your future generations to live in. I'm the result of this. My dad, who I look at as a beacon of integrity, his life is not over and I'm aware of that. He's not perfect but he has integrity. And I wanna build something in my life that'll last not just my lifetime, but far beyond my lifetime. It's about legacy. And the final thing is this, ultimately you become trustworthy. When you have integrity, you become trustworthy. People start to look to you as an example. People start to come to you and say, could you mentor me? How do I have integrity like you do? How do I have a marriage like you have? How do I walk in faith long term? How do I stand firm in trials and difficulties like you have? When you have integrity, you become an example and you become trustworthy. What a beautiful place to get to in your life. Not that it's ever about you, but when people start to come to you and say, hey, could I follow you as you follow Christ? That should be a goal for every single one of us in this life. Today, I'm going to end here for the sake of time. And um, I, if you guys would bow your heads and close your eyes, I want to pray for us today. That's what I want to ask that the Spirit would seal his word today. And this is the biggest thing. Even before you start praying, I want you to listen. So heads bowed, eyes closed, but just listen to this for a moment. Guys, we are hopeless to walk out of here and just try to live a life of integrity on our own. We can practice things. We can do things practically, yes. But right now, I want all of us to pray for this new infilling of the Holy Spirit. Because apart from the Spirit of God, we cannot do this. We cannot become like Christ without his Spirit. So even right now, under your breath, maybe with your hands open, would you just say, come Holy Spirit. Give me greater strength, greater power. Maybe even this, give me a greater desire to follow in the ways of Jesus. So for honest, that's where some of us miss the boat. We don't even have that desire to walk in integrity. But right now, Holy Spirit, would you just give us a greater desire to walk in the will and the ways of Jesus. Holy Spirit, speak to us right now. Strengthen us. God, would you forgive us in areas where we've had lapses, great lapses in integrity? 
Guys, I believe the process of rebuilding these weak areas and filling in these cracks, part of that is repentance and just saying before the Lord right now, God, I, I bring this to you and I repent before you. And I believe that allows the Spirit of God to come in and begin to fill those spaces. Lord, reinforce the areas of weakness. And like David prayed in Psalm 139, Lord, search us, God, know our hearts. Give us accountability in our life. Let us be honest with ourselves. And God, we just pray that you would change us from the inside out. Help us to be men and women of integrity that have a foundation built on you and that live an integrated life, bringing all of ourselves together as one. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.